have you checked the news lately? I mean, have you, have you, or have you totally banned yourself from watching the news? And you know, this past week, I had some crazy things going on, so I paid a lot less attention, and I found that my life, it, it, it was much more peaceful. But here's the thing. I began to notice something, and maybe you can help me out. I'm sure I'll get lots of advice, but I began to notice that, that even headlines, I don't, I don't even feel like it's news anymore, okay? So I don't watch news, but I, I read news, and every once in a while when I, I, I just skim through the, the headlines, I don't feel like it's news. I feel like it's trying to convince me of something. It's trying to tell me something. It's not telling me the facts, but it's opinions. Have you ever felt that way? And I'm not talking about fake news. I'm just simply talking about the fact that in general, there seems to be overall on both sides of the spectrum, an unwillingness to just present the facts. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to talk any more about that. But what I wanted you to know is that the Bible actually talks about some news. I wanted you to, to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 14 because here's the thing. We've been reading in Genesis in, in Revelation chapter 13 for the past few weeks. And we've been looking at some challenging things about the United States of America and Bible prophecy and about eventually the mark of the beast and about all these things that can be troubling, that can feel like really bad news. But we saw throughout that there are so many glimmers of the goodness of God in the midst of that. And it's only there as a warning to keep us from following this selfishness, this greed, this total veiling of really who God is and thinking that we have to appease him, but to recognize who he is. But Revelation chapter 14 is where we find the good news, you might say, in all of its fullness. This is the one of the most important chapters in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 14, it starts off by saying, hey, I looked and now I saw, after seeing the mark of the beast, after seeing the number is 666, then it says, I looked and there standing on Mount Zion was the lamb and 144,000 around him in the name of the father on their foreheads. They, they fully are recognizing who this God of love is. They're not a part of that system that totally misunderstands God. And then it goes on to say this in verse 6. Talking about those same people, it says, Then I saw another angel. Now you say, wait a second, no, this isn't talking about those people. This is talking about an angel. We have to understand that angel in the Greek is simply talking about messenger. And, and a messenger in the Bible, oftentimes God sends his messages through angels. Other times he sends them through prophets. And other times he simply sends his people to give a message. And I believe that as we look a little bit more deeply at this message that, that is unfolds in a threefold message, that we'll find that this is actually the message that, that God wants those people who have the name of God in their forehead. That's the message that they are telling to the world. It's going to help people experience freedom and liberty, liberty of conscience, like we talked about. They're going to be able to experience the things that the beast is trying to take away from them. But So it goes on to say that the, these people who are represented by this angel flying in the midst of heaven, this messenger flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So who is this message for? Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You see how clearly he wants it to be made that this is for absolutely everybody. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people. And, and not only is he describing every possible way that you can think about the world, but he's also saying, in, he's using the number four, which four represented the four points of the compass. It represented the four winds of heaven, the four horsemen. Each time four is used in Bible prophecy, it's often referring to the universality of, of what's being described there, the universality of the message. The, the, this, this is for the whole planet. But, but what is... What is for the whole planet? What is it? Did you read it? If you don't have a Bible, there's ones there, or I'll read it again for you. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 says this. Revelation 14, 6, there it is. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Okay, this is the only time in the entire Bible where everlasting gospel, this phrase, is used in the Bible. So, so latch on to it this morning. Hang on to this because this is important. It's in the, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, a last day message for the entire world. 
and its content can be summarized as the everlasting gospel. And what does gospel mean? Good news. It, it means good news. It doesn't mean good advice. It, it doesn't mean that, that God is sending a message to tell you what you need to do. It means it's telling you what God has already done for you and what he will do for you. It's news, not advice. And so oh, I need to remind you of something because we just saw the lamb standing there with 144,000 on Mount Zion. Let's go back to remember about this lamb. Go back to, to Revelation chapter 5. And we read these verses before, but, but they're so beautiful that you have to look at them again. If you remember, the, the prophet John, he's there seeing this scroll. That's the title deed for humanity, for planet Earth. And, and that scroll represents the fact that there's lamentation and woe, suffering on this planet. And if somebody doesn't do something, all of humanity, the wages of sin is death. And that will be the consequences and the end of the story for humanity. And, and when John sees that, that they look on heaven and earth and under the earth and, and nobody can open this scroll, he says, verse 4, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. He's just weeping, crying, because nobody can open this scroll. But one of the others said to me, verse 5, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. And then down in verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. We're going to do a little something a little different today. I just want for you to listen to this song. You are worthy. Is he worthy? And I, I just want you to, to contemplate for a moment, what if nobody was found? And then to realize the incredibly good news this morning that somebody has been found. And then we'll continue looking at the everlasting gospel. He is worthy. He is worthy. And that changes absolutely everything and and in fact that's what you find in revelation chapter 14 and look back at revelation chapter 14 when they're standing on mount zion with the lamb notice what it says about those who are standing there verse 3 it says they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and the elders and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth there, there's going to come a time when, when all the angels cease to sing, but, but humanity who chose to accept who Jesus is, that he is worthy, they will sing a song that the entire universe cannot sing because they have not been through being redeemed. I don't know what that song is going to be like, but I can't wait to sing what Revelation 14, 15 calls the song of the Lamb. You know, it's, it's all about beholding and recognizing that this is good news. That, that he has already accomplished something for you. It's not just good advice. It's good news. That's why John repeatedly points us to the Lamb. 29 times, I believe it is, in Revelation, he points us to the Lamb. But you remember when John is writing about Jesus' life, and he, he, he says... John the Baptist is preaching and he introduces Jesus to his disciples. How does he introduce Jesus? Do you remember? John is the one that captures this. In John 1, 29. Yeah, that's right. He said, behold the Lamb of God. Look, look, look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then throughout Revelation, you see the Lamb keeps appearing as it represents that God's love for you is so intense it's so reckless it's he's so head over heels in love with you that that he would rather lay down his life for you so that you could live and that he lived that that's the picture of the cross that he would go through hell for you and he did 
so that you can simply accept what he's done for you. But, but notice, it's not just the gospel. What, what's the qualifying word about the gospel here? Revelation 14, 6. It is the everlasting gospel. The only time that those two words come together in scripture, it's, it's the gospel that Revelation 13 actually gave us a little picture of this. Look back at Revelation 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8 says it this way. All who dwell on the earth will worship the dragon, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, this is, this is incredible because this is telling us that it, it's not just the fact that Jesus laid down his life for you on the cross. It's not just the good news about the cross, but the good news about the cross is, is that this is revealing what was in the heart of God when Moses prayed and said, show me your glory. But even before that, it's what has been in the heart of God all along and how he chooses to treat you. It, it's a, a done deal. Before sin, you already had a savior. Ephesians chapter one and verse four says it this way, that in him we are chosen before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He predestined us. He, he chose you beforehand. He's already planned it. He's already made the way. And this says that the book of life, he was already planning to have your name there before he created this planet. Now, nobody's jumping up and down yet, so I'm thinking that this isn't sinking in, right? This is incredibly good news. You cannot add to what Jesus has done for you. Just look at it this way. This is from the book Maranatha, page 100. It says it this way. The theme that attracts the sinner is Christ. The heart of the sinner is Christ, in him crucified. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world in unparalleled love. Present him thus to the hungry multitudes, and the light of his love will win men from darkness to light, from transgression to obedience and true holiness. And then a little bit later on, it says, Will not our church members keep their eyes fixed on the crucified and risen Savior? Fix your eyes on the Lamb, in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered. This is our message, our doctrine, our argument, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope for every believer. We can only awaken an interest in men's eyes that they will fix their eyes on Christ. We may step aside and ask them only to continue to fix their eyes upon the Lamb of God. You know, Another place in scripture that kind of gives us this picture of the reality of the everlasting good news of who God is in the core of his being. What, what really reveals to us what his glory is all about is back in Jeremiah chapter 31 where it uses a similar phrase. Because the gospel is the good news that God loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. And Jeremiah 31 says it this way. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3 says, The Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is, this is almost the same phrase. Instead of everlasting gospel, here we have everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. I'm, I'm pulling you. I'm tugging on your heart. I want you to know that this good news is there to draw you to me. And I'll tell you that I needed that this week. I need to recognize that this week. If any of you have had a tough week or a tough month or a tough year, some people talking about 2020 as being this horrific year, what we really need is to recognize that there is a good news that's found in Jesus that you can add nothing to the everlasting gospel. A lot of you have been praying for Mark. And I just want to say thank you so much for doing that. A lot of you gave to help Mark. And I want to say thank you so much for doing that. And, and today, I want to say enough, but not too much. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about my week. A little bit about some of your friends' weeks. A little bit about Mark's week. So Mark had an amazing first few days at the depression recovery program up at Weimar. 
And then I got a call on Sunday night that things weren't going as well. And then on Monday morning, I tried to talk to him and wasn't able to make any headway. So I said, I, I need to get up there because they're going to have to dismiss him. I'm going to try to get up there as fast as I can. And so I jumped in the car. My mom jumped in the car with me and we drove up past Sacramento up to Weimar. And we got up there and tried to talk to him. And you have to realize something that, that this isn't Mark that we're dealing with here. That, that, that I know a different Mark than I saw there. And, and as I was trying to talk to him, it was, it was impossible to make any headway. We stayed that night. The next day, things kept going that direction until finally he had to be dismissed from the program. Hey, what was it that that everlasting love did, do you remember? It, it draws, it pulls, it, it never gives up. It's, it's a reality, the good news that God won't stop going after you. And, and I just want to reassure you on the one hand that Dr. Nedley in talking to him, he said, you know, this actually could be a huge success. We have learned some things, we have reports, we have blood work, we have a lot of things that, that can give future care mark that, that could be really life-changing for him so if you look at this this is actually could be seen as a huge success for him and he said i'm actually willing to do more than usual and, and to have some consultations and to work with with mark and even work with uh, providers in your area to figure out the best possible solution and we're all a family here right so, so the things that i'm sharing here i hope that you'll recognize that this is merely for us to recognize that Mark is somebody that needs our love, and that there are people all around us that need our love, and that the gospel is what empowers that love. The gospel is what enables us to be able to love. Because this everlasting gospel, this everlasting love, it says, has drawn us. It's, it's always been there seeking us, going ahead of us, pulling us in. Before you ever thought about Jesus, he was thinking about you. But I can't tell you how heartbreaking that day was for me. Mark had to leave and he really didn't want to leave. And as he was leaving, I followed him. My mom and I followed him for two long hours saying, look, it's okay. Just get in the car. We'll take you home. It's going to be all right. For two hours, I fled. I wish I could tell you that he came home with me. But I know that God's love never ends. And I know that the story isn't done for Mark. He chose that day. And we eventually had to leave and go on. And he chose to end up on the streets of Sacramento to make the long story short. But I know this for a fact. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. This is good news that is unchangeable in Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you just for a moment to listen to this song, The Love of God. The love of God is measureless. It never ends. It's everlasting. This is the everlasting gospel. It's the fact that on the cross, God was simply revealing who he is. And that it did not change God, the fact that he died on the cross for you. The fact is that, that God is love that is very core. And that, that he desires to give you mercy and grace. That, that he has already accomplished everything in Christ. And that you can add nothing to that. And as you recognize that he now looks at you. As it says in 1 John. That he looks at you as his child. Uh, adopted in the blood was the language in Ephesians chapter 1 that we, we saw. It, it, taken into heavenly places Ephesians goes on to say. And to know that when Jesus looked at his son as he was baptized and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. 
that that is the reality that he speaks to you today. Romans chapter 4 says that this way, God calls those things which do not exist as though they do exist. And he tells you in advance the fact of who you are in Christ because as you accept being in Christ, it will change absolutely everything in your life. God will never stop searching for you. He'll never stop running after you. And I'm so thankful for all the friends this week that have helped out in various ways. I called multiple times to uh, to, to Weimar to a, a friend there that I, I just met this week. Actually, he didn't even know me. Who multiple times went and gave Mark a ride. And then later on, he searched for him. When, when we, we ended up hearing on, we didn't hear from him until he lost make a long story short I should have clarified that I think we're not just dealing with alcoholism but we also have there's always mental health issues involved and so um, we have to recognize that, that this is an amazing child of God that God has amazing plans for and so many of you have known that as you've met him but I'm so thankful for for people whose lives have been transformed by the gospel to say oh yeah I could go now I'll drive down and I'll search for a couple of hours. I'll look. I'll see if I can find him. It's worth it. Because that's the heart of Jesus. Jesus told the story. He said, look, if a shepherd loses one sheep, he'll leave the 99 behind and he'll go and he'll find that one sheep. And in the same way, I tell you that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over all the righteous. And that's true of you. Just let that sink in. There's more rejoicing in heaven over you than the, the 99 unlost worlds out there, than over the unfallen universe. God sees you as his precious treasure, and you are of incredible value. Now, this can be hard to sink in. I mean, why does God value me? I didn't do anything for him to value me. And, and did he really value me before I was born? How does that even look? What? I can't really wrap my mind around that. I was trying to think about that, you know, does he really accept me? Is this really the way that God treats us? And then I remembered something. I remembered back in January of 2019, January 16, uh, for several nights I had not slept well. And again that night I did not sleep well. And, and I remember writing a letter that day. And, and I was writing a letter to, to a human being who had not taken a breath of fresh air yet actually two of them see my girls would be born on january 17 the next day and leah said we should we should write them some letters so i began to pour out my heart what i was feeling in that moment and, and as i i read this just just think about if a sinful parent could ever feel like this then how could an infinitely loving pure god feel about you, even though you feel like you don't measure up. Dear Libby, wow, I think my heart could burst. I love you so much already. You are so special, Libby. God gave us this verse for you. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? That's our prayer for you to be filled with joy and peace and to be overflowing with hope and to share those gifts with everyone around you. You've already been doing that and you aren't even born yet. People around the world are praying for you. You should have heard the church praising and thanking Jesus for you on Monday night when I told them you would be born this Thursday. I can't wait to hold you for the first time tomorrow, Livy. Thank you for making your daddy's heart so full. I love you. I hadn't even met her yet. And yet God somehow put a little seed of that love that, that he has for you into my heart. A sinful, selfish dad. Dear Abby, I can't believe you're going to be born in 29 hours. I have barely been able to sleep the past two nights. I'm just so excited to hold you. Abby, you are a miracle. Your life is already a testimony that the God we love is mighty to save. Abby, we were worried sick about you when we found out your growth had slowed. You ended up with less nutrition than Libby, and the doctors really scared us about the chances of you surviving. But Abby, 
Your Father in Heaven loves you so much and He inspired people around the world to be praying for you. And you need to know that your mommy loves you so much too. She went through so much to try and get you the nutrition and protein you needed to grow. She was so full, she thought she was going to burst. And yet I would keep just keep pleading with her to eat more. We just wanted you to be healthy, Abby. The day, that day, the day we were most scared about our next ultrasound, mommy found a feather right by the sidewalk on the way into the office. It reminded us that God's eye is on the sparrow and of how much more value we were our precious baby girls. Then I shared the verse, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save you, will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Never forget this, Abby. That's how God feels about you. He has a purpose for you to continue bringing joy to people through pointing them to their God who is mighty to save. He is a God of amazing grace, hence your middle name. Oh, Abby, it won't be long now. Be prepared for a whole lot of love. You are special, so special to us. I love you. Friends, it, it sounds preposterous. It sounds like too good of news that God already loves you no matter what you've done. But God demonstrates his own love for you in this, that while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. That's the good news. And it's not good advice. It's not to tell you how to live your life. It's to tell you what Jesus has already fully done for you. There's places we can look throughout the Bible. Psalm 136 repeats over and over. The mercy or the steadfast love of God never ceases. And, but I wanted to, to give you another song that, that, that repeats a, a modernized understanding of this reckless abandonment of love that God has determined to have towards you. So go ahead and, and listen to this song. It's called Reckless love oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of god did you catch that there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down or lie you won't tear down coming after me it's that everlasting love that draws that pulls that will not give up on you and that won't give up on your loved one that you may be thinking about right now they, they won't give up on the world out there that's lost as long as they'll accept the invitation. You know, this is what sums up really, I'm beginning to realize that the crucial matter in the end, Matthew 24 says it like this, talking about this same gospel, it says it this way, that in the end, lawlessness will increase. And because lawlessness is increased, the love of many will grow cold. Are we seeing that today? Hatred and selfishness is abounding and, and love is beginning to grow cold. But then it says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures in what? Endures in love. Who allows God to rekindle that love every day. Who fixes their mind on the God who has fully loved them. And loves because he first loved you. And then it says, and this gospel, this good news about a love that will not come to an end, that will stir love within his people, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. My friends, preaching does not just mean talking. I know I do a lot of that on Sabbath morning. But it means to go out there to chase after people to say, come back. God is loving you with an everlasting love and he'll never stop loving you. So thank you for being a church family that does that over and over again. Who opens up your heart. Friends, it's worth it. It's worth it to give our all to love people towards Jesus. And people have to choose whether they'll accept the invitation or not. But the reality is that it is good news, not good advice. Jesus has already accomplished it for you. Last night I was preparing to speak for the Zoom Vespers here. And, and just to clarify again, what, as I share a little bit of Mark's story, it's fresh to me. It's, it's this part that I know. 
Um, some of you have done so much for Mark and for so many other people. What I'm, I'm just sharing what I know. I want to be real with you as a pastor. I don't want to get up here and pretend like I didn't have a tough week. Or like I didn't wish that I could change things in somebody's life. But I hope that as a church family, as we hear just a little tiny glimmer, that we become more and more that church that opens our eyes, our arms wide and doesn't say, why did you do that? Or what have you been up to? But that says, although we may draw some boundaries, you're welcome back as soon as you're ready. Welcome back. It opens our arms wide for people. So last night I was preparing uh, my little Vespers talk for Monterey Bay Academy uh, on Zoom. And it was about an hour before that started that I suddenly got another phone call. Mark was in the hospital in Sacramento. He said, I got, I got jumped. I got, I have this injury on my head. They're going to do a CT scan. I'm in the hospital and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And let me tell you, if I didn't know that God's steadfast love never ceased, maybe my love would cease. But what God calls us to do is to do everything possible. Yes, set boundaries, but do everything possible. So I called my brother up and I said, look, he's scared. He's in the hospital. Is there any possible way? He's like, yeah, I'm going right now. I'm already in Roseville. I'll be there. He drove there within half an hour. He's there at the hospital searching for him finally ends up finding him and works with him, tries to gain trust to be able to get in his car. And, and here's the deal. We worked something out because I was about to speak at a Vespers. I couldn't go up there. And, and I said, well, I can't even meet my brother halfway there. What am I going to do? And Leah said, well, let's call, let's call my dad and my brother-in-law. And, and they'll go another halfway between them and from Salinas to Sacramento and, and they'll meet halfway. And he could, he could have this ride. But, but you see, here's the thing. The everlasting gospel is good news, but you got to get in the car. You have to get in the car. And Mark got in the car. My brother. And he rode all the way. And they met somewhere on the five. And he got in the car again with my, my father-in-law and brother-in-law. And then I left after the Vespers. I drove up to Salinas and I met them at a park and ride near Salinas. He got in the car with me. Before that, actually, he gave me a huge hug. He was talking about how sorry he was. He recognizes he doesn't want to be in this situation. He wants help. He wants to be safe. And yet, you got to get in the car. I'm so thankful for so many of you that care so much. And I'm so thankful for my friend, Matt, that I can call like any time, day or night. And he comes over here and sets up uh, a place for him to sleep last night uh, up at the, the farm. Got here after midnight last night, or, or maybe it was one o'clock, I don't remember. And the story is not over. I can tell you that. But I hope that our love never comes to an end for Mark or for any other person. Because the steadfast love of the Lord for us never ceases. It never comes to an end. He will pursue you. Just get in the car. Just get in the car. Is that your desire today to get in the car with Jesus? To say, okay. You've accomplished it. I want in your desire to say yes to Jesus. And not only just to say yes, but to say, would you let this reality sink in so deep that I'm a child of God, that it would lead me to love and pursue people and to pull them back. And you keep running after Jesus and after people, pulling them back, hoping that they will listen to this incredible everlasting gospel that needs to go to the entire world. Do you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord God, we thank you. Your love never ceases. It is the everlasting good news. It's not just good advice. It tells us what you have already accomplished for us. Lord, may that reality 
of your love, stir love within us that will lead us to endure in the end. Oh Lord, would you pour out your Holy Spirit and God, we want to ask a special prayer for our friend Mark. God, you know what he's going through. I ask that you'd pursue him in love. He asked for prayers, and I know many here are already praying for him. Please, God, please deliver him in the name of Jesus. And Lord, there are loved ones of people sitting here right now who are going through very similar situations. Would you please let them know that your love will never stop pursuing them? And would you please give us all wisdom, how we can love the people around us in the right ways, the ways that will help them in the long term. God, thank you that your love is reckless, it's never ending, that it will climb any mountain and push down any door, tear down every lie. Oh God, may we let that love sink in deep to our hearts. We desperately need it. Please help us to go back to our Bibles every day. Help us to really get to know you as this God of love. And then to share this everlasting good news with the world. Help us to stop just giving people advice, but to tell them there is good news about the salvation that is already accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.